All right, well, good evening, everybody. Glad to have you out here this evening. We are uh, continuing the spiritual formation class, and um, so this will be the, the second session, which I titled it The Gospel, which we are going to be talking about the gospel, but I could have just as easily titled this lesson Salvation. Um, so just know we'll be talking about salvation and, of course, the gospel uh, within salvation, but yeah, that's... Uh, that's the plan for tonight. And so, like I did last time, before um, I open in prayer, I'm going to give you the main idea up front, okay? I'll give you the main idea up front, then we'll pray, and then we'll get started. So again, this is session two, the gospel, and here is the main idea. Christians are to live in light of their salvation, having a thorough understanding of salvation and specifically the relationship of justification and sanctification is crucial for spiritual formation. Now, if you don't know what some of those words mean, by the end of this lesson, you will, okay? If not, then I failed. <laughs> but if you remember the, the well, I'm going to be going into a review uh, in a minute, but what you want to do is you want to take the main ideas of each lesson and kind of start stacking them on top of each other because they're all very important in the total project of, um, of spiritual formation. So again, we're supposed to live in light of our salvation. We got to take that away from this. But in order for you to do that, you have to have a good understanding of the doctrine of salvation, which is a really big doctrine. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And specifically, we're going to hone in on the relationship between two aspects of salvation. One is called justification. The other is called sanctification. Now, some of you know what this means. Some of you don't. But by the end, hopefully um, everyone will. So let's go ahead and uh, go to the Lord in prayer. And then uh, we'll jump into this. Lord God, we just thank you so much that we're able to gather together tonight and continue this class on spiritual formation, and I pray, Lord, that you would use this to help build your people up and make them more like Jesus, to, to help sanctify them. And so, God, we, uh, we pray this to you, and I pray that you would help me teach it well and skillfully, and that everything I say will be biblically true. And so, God, we just pray um, all this and that you would get all the glory, God, and we pray this all in Jesus, our Lord's name. Amen. Alrighty, so let me just really quickly review. And by the way, remember, like what I said last week, this is interactive. So when I ask you guys questions, um, I, I would really love it if people who want to answer would go back to that microphone back there. Uh, don't worry, no cameras on you. Nobody will see you. They'll just hear you. Um, but it makes it, it, makes it uh, interactive where I ask a question and then um, you guys could, uh, you know, share your answers. So if you know you're in a talkative mood, just always be ready to, to go back and forth to that microphone. Exercise is good anyway. It's not, not that far of a walk anyway. So here's my first question, that reviewing what we talked about last time. What is the person of God, the man or woman of God, what are they supposed to be like? Like, what was the main idea last week? Like, what ultimately is a disciple? Yes, and remember the microphone if you could. But yeah, a, 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 the man or woman of God is a disciple of Jesus Christ that makes other disciples of Jesus Christ. Fundamentally, that is what we are. Okay, so then here's the next question. What is the will of God in your life? Oh, Joseph's on his way back there. What is the will of God in your life? It's one of those fancy words. Thank you. The will of God for our life is our sanctification, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, I believe. Yep. Amen, amen. The will of God for our life is our sanctification. Okay, next question. How are we supposed to make disciples according to Matthew 28? What's the verb and then what's the th participles that show us the how-to? Yeah, yeah, if you could, Teresa. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, I believe it's we go to them, we baptize them, and we teach them. Amen. That's how we do it, right? So the verb is to make the disciples. The way we do it is just like Teresa said. We go to them, we baptize them, and we teach them to obey everything that Jesus has taught us. You know, Jesus does not, you don't need to go to a how do we win the world for Christ class and, and have somebody give you the latest innovative strategies. You just got to listen to what Jesus says. 
He tells us how to do it, so very good. Um, next question, what does it mean to count the cost of discipleship? What does it mean to count the cost of discipleship? Well, I'll, I'll help us along. Make sure you're willing to put Jesus above all else. If you're not willing to take up your cross and follow him, if you're not willing to love him more than all of your other earthly relations, then he says you are not worthy to be his disciple. You will start, but you will not finish. You'll be like the person who starts on the tower, doesn't finish it, and then everybody's like, oh, look at that stupid person who didn't finish the tower. So count the cost when it comes to the Christian life. And then finally, simple question to cap this off, what is the main goal of discipleship? It's the goal of it all. Very simple. Who are we trying to be? Yeah, if you could talk in the microphone. Goal of discipleship. Christine's got this. To make more disciples. Yes, yeah, that's ultimately what we want to do. Yes. But I'm going to make it even simpler because um, that, that's what we do. That's like what the disciple does. But the ultimate goal is to be like Jesus, right? To be like Jesus that, that you know, when a person is fully trained, they become like their teacher. So the idea of uh, spiritual formation is to be like our teacher. And our teacher is Jesus, who did make disciples all the time. So yeah, that's definitely a big part of it. So very good. You guys killed that review. Every, uh, every week we're going to review what we talked about the week before. That way we don't forget. Um, so pretty much what we're going to do is now build on this. We're, we're going to build on this. And so um, last time I began by asking, what is the man or woman of God like? And we answered that the person is a disciple of Jesus that makes other disciples of Jesus. So if you're going to make disciples of Jesus, you have to first be a disciple yourself, right? You can't make disciples if you're not a disciple. And being a disciple that makes disciples, it requires that you understand the gospel. Because how do you bring somebody into the kingdom? Through the gospel, right? So if you're a disciple, you're somebody who believed the gospel, you also got to be able to, to share the gospel. So we're going to add then to what we talked about last week. See, if the man or woman of God is a disciple that makes disciples, then that means the man or woman of God is someone that understands the gospel well. They understand salvation well. So the goal of this lesson is to help you understand salvation very well, to where like, not to boast or brag, but if you retain everything that is taught tonight, you're going to know more about salvation than 99.99% of all other Christians in our country. It's, it, and it shouldn't be that way. If we're able to do this in an hour, then why doesn't everybody know this? But many just won't teach it. But the point is, our goal is to understand salvation extremely well. So before we begin, I'd like to ask a question and uh, feel free to answer, what is salvation? What is salvation? If anybody wants to take their shot, and don't worry, I won't be mean and be like, no, nah, that's horrible, or you left this out. No, just generally, this doesn't have to be precise. Salvation uh, is the free gift of God that he gives by grace through faith when we uh, put our faith and trust in him and repent and turn from our sin. That's fantastic. Um, salvation from what? Sin. Sin, yep. And, and, the, and ultimately the wrath of God. There you go. Sin and its penalty. Very good. And uh, what is the gospel? You don't have to break the gospel down, but what does the word mean? Gospel. Good news. The, the good news, the evangelion, the good news. Excellent. Okay, so we know the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. So let me ask this. For there to be good news, what else does there have to be? Bad news. It makes no sense to say this is the good news if you don't have bad news that is compared to. The good news overcomes the bad news. And indeed, there is bad news. So when we're going to understand salvation, the first thing we need to understand is the bad news. And the bad news is all humanity is captive to sin. Okay, sin is, a, we're in shackles, we're enslaved, we're dead in sin. I mean, it, it's just all pervasive. We are sinners. And so I'm going to start with Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, and verse 32, and I'll have it up here, but I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I mean, hopefully, if you can't get your eyes checked. No, anyway, just kidding. Um, but I'm going to read Romans 1, 18 through 25, and then verse 32. It gives us a very powerful description of those who pretty much have fallen humanity, those enslaved to sin. So let me go ahead and read this. Paul says, 
For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served what has been created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. And then skipping down to Romans 1.32. <clears throat> Although they know God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. Okay, so that's a big passage. And it, I, I would love it if some folks would go to the microphone just to give me some of the descriptions that Paul gave us of fallen humanity. What are some ways he describes fallen humanity in that passage? Joseph's working them legs today because he's sitting in the front and then the microphone's all the way in the back. <laughs> You're not lying. <laughs> okay, so one of the things that I'll highlight um, is that it says, I believe it's in verse 19, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them, it leaves humanity without an excuse. For people okay. to say there is no God, there's going to be no judgment, none of those things. God has clearly revealed himself in creation and, uh, and what is seen. So I just want to say that just one point so everybody can have an opportunity. Yeah, amen. Anybody want to add to that? Anything else Paul says? Well, David's got his hand up. Um, just quickly that we suppress the truth by our unrighteousness. That is kind of piggybacking off what he said, that what can be known is true, but we suppress it through unrighteousness. Yeah, everybody knows there's a God. It's inscribed in our heart, but they suppress that truth and unrighteousness. Good. Anything else? I'll give you the laundry list, right? Paul says because fallen humanity is under God's wrath and it was without excuse, we have senseless and darkened hearts says that, senseless and darkened hearts. Um, we've exchanged the truth for the lie. We worship the creature instead of the creator. Fallen humanity applauds evil and deserves death. So those are key descriptors. So think about it. Senseless, darkened hearts. So when people say, trust your heart, wait a second. The heart is darkened and senseless. Do people love truth? Nope, they've exchanged the truth for a lie. Do people worship what is true? No, they worship the creature rather than the creator. Do people uh, hate evil? Yeah, sometimes, but by and large, fallen humanity applauds evil. We make excuses for it. And ultimately, because of this, fallen humanity deserves death. So the gospel is the good news because it tells us what God has done to save us despite our sin. Without God's saving work, it would be impossible for us to be disciples of Jesus. The only reason we can be disciples is because God makes salvation available. Now, back in, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve rebelled against God and they became sinners. And as soon as they rebelled, their nature changed from being upright or morally good. It changed to them being sinners. Everybody who was born after Adam and Eve sinned were born with the sin nature. And by the way, that's everybody. Adam and Eve had no kids before the fall, okay? So every human that's been born has been born with the nature they had after they sinned. Now, if you were to read Genesis 3 carefully, it tells you how they changed. Adam and Eve ate the fruit, and then right away, they ran from God. They hid from God. They covered up their sin with the fig leaves, and then they blamed others, even God, for their sin. And listen, everybody is like that. All Adam and Eve's children are like that. We have the propensity to do as Adam and Eve did. And so because of that, God would be fair. He would be just if he condemned us to hell forever, right? If he condemned us to hell right now. 
Haven't we earned it? Haven't we all sinned? Haven't we run from God, lied to God, blamed God, and done all this stuff? Yeah, we have all earned condemnation. And that means none of us actually deserve to be disciples. And somebody might say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I do a lot of good deeds. I remember saying that to the preacher that converted me. I was making my final appeal for my own goodness. And, uh, and when he told me it just takes one sin to go to hell, I'm like, I'm in trouble. You know? And then he said, imagine if you've done one per day. He's like, how long have you been alive? And I start calculating the days. I'm like, oh, that's a lot. And he's like, look, I know you've done more than one a day. I'm like, yeah, me too. And so it started to stack up. And I started to see I wasn't good. But even the good things that people do that make them think that they're, they're right with God. I mean, look what Isaiah 6, 64, 6 says about that. It says, all of us have become like something unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. You know, and I, I'm not trying to be crass for the sake of being crass, but polluted garment, it's talking about the, the cloth or fabric that a woman who was on her monthly cycle would use to absorb the discharges. So, I mean, today you would say our good deeds are like a pad. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a pretty gross thought when you think about it, but that's what God says it ultimately amounts to. That means there's no possible way we could save ourselves by just being good. That won't cut it. Okay, so... It's important that we come to terms with this. The, the person who is saved has to come to terms with this. We are disciples not because of our goodness, not because of, of good works, but we are disciples because of grace. God chose to save us by grace and grace alone. And so the more we know about our gracious salvation, this should cause four things to happen in our lives. First, we should become very thankful to God and want to serve him. That you're a sinner deserving of death, but by grace alone, he chose to save you. Even though you don't deserve it, you should be thankful. Very thankful and want to serve him out of that. God, you saved me, now let me serve you. Second, we should be humble. Very humble. Salvation should make nobody arrogant. When people are walking around with a chip on their shoulder, when they look at the lost of the world, it's like, don't you forget that you were saved by grace? And without grace, you'd be just like these people? And so the point is, we should be humble, not arrogant. And then third, we should want to tell everyone else about the good news of Jesus. Imagine being saved, knowing you're going to live forever, and then thinking, yeah, but I don't want to tell anybody else about it. That'd be just evil. That's rotten. You should want everybody else to know about it. And then fourth, we should want to live our lives in a way that pleases God. So we should be thankful, we should be humble, we should be evangelistic, and we should want to live in the way God tells us to live. Not in the way that we want to, but in the way that he calls us to live. So what I want to do for the rest of this lesson is talk about the doctrine of salvation. The fancy word is soteriology. Uh, soteriology, S-O-T-E-R-I-O-L-O-G-Y. So yeah, it's, it's Greek. Soter means savior. And then ology always means the study of. So the study of salvation is soteriology. Now, if you don't want to use the fancy term, that's fine. You could just say that uh, we're talking about the doctrine of salvation because that's what it means. When you understand the doctrine of salvation, you understand who and what we are and what God's made us, okay? And so it feeds into everything else we're going to be learning for the rest of this course. Now, I'm going to divide the doctrine of salvation into four parts, four spheres. The first one is what God did to save you before you ever believed, okay? What God did to save you before you ever believed, okay? And by the way, like I'll I'll have it in the headings of the slides, these four categories. So if you don't get it all right now, don't worry, it'll be up there. But first, what what God did before you believed in Jesus. The second category is what God did the moment you believed Jesus. So there's parts of salvation that happen the moment you believe. Third, what God does for the rest of your life after you believe in Jesus. That's the third part of salvation. And then fourth, what God does after this life ends, okay? The doctrine of salvation covers all of that. And one reason people get confused is they don't understand that. 
A lot of times they just talk about salvation as if it's, oh, I believed and I was saved. That's one part of salvation. It's called justification. The more precise we are, the less we confuse categories. And the more we're able to, to understand exactly what the word of God is telling us. So when it comes to the first sphere, when it comes to the first category, the things of salvation that God did before we believe, there's actually four. Four things God did before you ever even knew him. First is election. Second is drawing. Not like artist drawing, but him drawing you to him. Third is regeneration. And fourth is calling. And I'm going to quickly go over each of these. So election, drawing, regeneration, and calling. That's what God does before you actually confess Jesus as Lord. So let's take these in order. The first thing God did in making a move towards your salvation was election. Okay, simply put, God chose us before the foundation of the world for salvation. Before he ever even made the earth, before Adam and Eve were made, before angels were made, God already elected his people for salvation. Now, a lot of people hate this doctrine, especially in our society, but the Bible is very clear. There are a boatload of passages about this. I'm going to share the most clear one, um, and it's, it's Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Look what Paul says. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ, for he chose us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us, in the beloved one. And, you know, he tells us, like, because a lot of times people will be like, okay, if he predestined us, why? Is it because he looked down the corridor of time and saw that we were worthy and would choose him? No. It tells us right there, he predestined us according to the good pleasure of his will. For whatever reason, it was the good pleasure of his will. That's the basis of our election. So the passage is very clear. This election, this aspect of our salvation happened before the world was even made. Uh, that means it's before Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Before the very, ver very first verse of the Bible, this was already done. So that's definitely before you believed. Now, if this was my systematic theology class, I would be spending a lot more time on this and give you a whole bunch more verses on election and give you all the arguments for it and dispute and refute all the arguments against it. If you want a deeper dive, as I said, I've got a 115 lecture systematic theology class on our sermon audio. You could just find soteriology or doctrine of salvation, find the ones titled election, and boom, you'll have it all there. I think it only takes one scripture to establish a doctrine. I shared one. There's a lot more than that one. But the point of this lesson isn't just election. It's the whole thing of salvation. So again, uh, I'm going to be moving fast. But before I move on, I do want to just... Focus on Romans 9, verses 18 through 23, because people struggle with this doctrine, and Paul rebukes that struggle. He's not even saying, man, I understand where you're coming from. No, he's like, knock it off. Look what he says in Romans 9, 18 through 23. Of God, he says, so then, he has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. You will say to me, therefore, why then does he still find fault? For who could resist his will? But who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? Will what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God, wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on the objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory? And so again, Paul tells us, look, this is in the mystery of God's will. He gets more glory this way. Uh, the people who, are, uh, who choose destruction for themselves, you know, because they, again, we're going to go into other parts of salvation that are necessary. They don't have those other parts, so they choose to stay like the Romans one person we read about. That's what they want to do. And because of that, we get to see God's justice. You know, we get to see what true justice looks like on them. 
But for those who do believe, we get to see what mercy looks like. We get to see what grace looks like. And so humanity gets a much bigger picture of God because he chose to do it this way. And sometimes it's hard to uh, like that, but Paul pretty much says he's God, we're not. He knows what he's doing. He's got a good reason for everything. And those who do end up condemned, did they not sin? Did they not choose to sin? Did they not want to sin? Obviously they did. Um, so it's still fair. Whatever happens, is it's still fair. But anyhow, okay, so that's the first one, election. Um, God in eternity past chose us in Christ to be the recipients of his glorious grace. The next move God makes is now when you're alive. And it's the, the doctrine of drawing, okay? So you're not saved yet, but God starts drawing you. Now, a couple things we got to understand. First, when Adam and Eve chose to sin, all humanity became sinners with sin natures. And as a result, on our own, we would never come to God. That's why we need this drawing, okay? We would never come to him. We would always resist him. In fact, uh, uh, Stephen, when he's preaching against his people in Acts chapter 7, he says, you always resist the Holy Spirit. That's what humanity does. They resist the Holy Spirit. And so consider what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 13, 23. He says, can the Cushite change his skin or the leopard his spots? If so, you might be able to do what is good, you who are instructed in evil. Okay, so what he's saying is, in the same way that a leopard can't take his spots off, we can't change our nature. Our nature is we're, we're stuck. We love sinning, okay? And so here's the thing. If we can't do the ultimate good, and yet believing in Jesus is the ultimate good, then it means without help, we can't believe in Jesus. We won't. We won't want to. We'll reject him every time. So how does God overcome our sin nature? How does he overcome our resistance? First, he does two things. First, he draws us to Jesus. Now, the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John makes this clear. We're going to look at a couple verses from John chapter 6. In verse 37, Jesus says this, Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. Okay? So that's a clear statement of who comes to Jesus. Who comes to him? those that the Father gives him. So that refers to those who were elect, right? So the first part of salvation, those that God chose, okay? He then gives them to Jesus and they come. But the question is, how does God give them to Jesus? Then you look at John 6, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. There's the doctrine of drawing right? It's a clear statement about our ability or inability. He says no one can come. He doesn't say some people can't come. He says no one can come unless something happens first. What's that thing that must happen first? The father must draw him. So this is the second uh, thing of salvation that God does before we ever believe. Now this word draw in the Greek means to pull, drag, or haul. Some people try to say it's a sweet Melody he plays, and we didn't know. No, this word is to pull, drag, or haul. He's pulling us against our nature. Not so much against our will, okay, but against our nature. Our nature is to go the opposite way of God, but God starts like, like catching a fish, starts reeling us, reeling us in. When you catch a fish, it's still trying to swim the other way, okay? But God is drawing us, drawing us in. And for those who reject Christ... It's because they're not being drawn, and so they're going to keep swimming the opposite way. Now, at the end of chapter 6, a lot of people reject Jesus. At first, they love him because he fed them. Then he taught them something really hard, and they all abandoned him. And here's what he says at the end, John 6, 65. He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Right? If, if, they're, if it's not granted by the Father, and they're not being drawn then they're not going to come. Again, they're going to keep swimming the other way. Now, drawing's not enough. Drawing's him pulling you in the direction of Jesus, but you still have that sin nature. You still have that problem that Jeremiah brought up. So this then brings us to the next thing that God does before you believe. Something else needs to happen. God needs to make you spiritually alive, okay? Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, 
People are born spiritually dead. What that means is they are spiritually separated from God and they have an inability to come to him on their own. As Jesus said, no one can come. We have this inability that's part of our spiritual death. So God has to reverse that. God has to change that. And he does so by making you born again. This is the third thing. It's called regeneration. Regeneration is the technical term. The layman's term is being born again. Okay, same thing. Regeneration means he breathes this new life into you, this new spiritual life so that you could do spiritual things that you couldn't do before. It's the same thing as being born again. Now, until that regeneration happens, you can't even see the spiritual reality of who Christ is. Look at John chapter three, verse three. Uh, John chapter three, verse three, Jesus replied to Nicodemus. He says, truly, I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Without that new birth, you can't even see it. Jesus is just going to look like a, a lunatic to you or somebody that's demanding things of you, but why, why should I listen to Jesus? You can't even see it. But once you're born again and you have this new life and then you look at Jesus, you can't not see it anymore. You're like, whoa, he is the Messiah. He is who, who he says he is. Now, how does this regeneration happen? Because some people want to say, well, we control it. We make ourselves born again. Let me ask you, did you make yourself born in the first place? Did, did you like, you didn't exist, but you're like, mom and dad get together on this day because I'm going to exist? No, it didn't work that way. It wasn't your will. It happened to you. And it's the same thing with being born again. Look at how Jesus describes it a few verses later in John chapter three, verses seven through eight. He says, do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. Just like you can't control the wind, you, you know the wind's there. You know like, oh, the wind blew on me. Huh, interesting. Okay, you know it, but you can't control it. You don't know what caused it. You just know it because you feel it. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. One moment you're spiritually dead, next minute all of a sudden your eyes are open and you're like, I believe this. I believe what I'm hearing. This all makes sense to me. You've been hit by the Holy Spirit. You don't know from what direction he came. You just, you now feel the effects. You're like, I am different now. Something's different. And now you're able to perceive what you weren't able to perceive before. Now, at the same time that God makes us born again so that we could see the kingdom of God, and so now we can choose to enter it by faith at that same time he calls us. So making us born again and God calling us, they're different things, but they happen at the same time, okay? Sometimes people confuse them because they happen at the same time. But listen, being born again is not the same as being called. Being born again means, what does it mean to be born? Life is given to you. Being called means somebody's calling you. Two different things, right? So what happens before you believe is God calls you in such a way that you come. The very calling itself leads to the coming. It's almost when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus immediately rose from the dead. Okay, he was called by name and he rose from the dead and he couldn't help but to come out. That's what God's call is like. And so all believers throughout the New Testament, again and again, they are called the called. Do you know the word church, ecclesia? Do you know what it means in Greek? The called out ones. And if you look in all the letters from Romans all the way to Jude, look up the word called. Every time the word is used, it is either referring to believers or referring to the fact that whoever God calls is saved. So there's no getting called and not being saved, at least not with this kind of calling. Now, what does it mean that God calls us? Let me give you a, a good definition. It's an act of God the Father. So the Father's the one that calls, according to the Bible. It's an act of God the Father, and he's speaking to you through the human proclamation of the gospel, which, in which he then summons people to himself in such a way that they respond with saving faith. So I want you to think about that. It doesn't happen when you're sitting in a lotus position all by yourself, okay? It happens when somebody is preaching the gospel to you. Okay, so a faithful human servant is being a disciple that makes disciples. 
So he, he or she is calling this person into salvation, preaching the gospel, and as the person is hearing that gospel, the Holy Spirit regenerates them, gives them that new life. They're like, whoa, this is making sense. And then the father's like, come, believe. And, and again, you're not hearing this in your head, but it's what's happening as the human is proclaiming the gospel. Okay, so next time you're scared to evangelize, I want you to understand something. I don't care how eloquent and smart you are. If the spirit doesn't regenerate them and the father doesn't call them, they're not going to come. And I don't care how clumsy you are with your words and how you could sound like porky pig when you're preaching the gospel. If the spirit regenerates them and the father calls them, they will come. So what does that mean? Don't be scared to evangelize. If God is going to save this person. He is calling them as you're talking. And that is infinitely powerful. And it can overcome your weak words. Okay? This should make us all the most fearless evangelists in the world. And yet we get all scared. What if they say no? What if they make fun of me? What if they ask a question I can't answer? Listen, God will call them if it is their time. And if it's not, you're planting a seed. And it'll be for somebody else to water. And the Spirit is the one that'll make it grow. You just have to be faithful. Notice that God does not do his part of calling them without us doing our part of preaching. So we have to go out there and preach, right? Now, Paul, talking about the calling, he says this in 2 Thessalonians 2.14. He says of God, he called you to this through our gospel. Isn't that what I just said? So that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is how the calling happens. So, in summary, God already starts working your salvation long before you ever believe. He starts by electing you before time. He then provides the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross in real time 2,000 years ago, which sets everything in place for you to be saved the moment you believe. Then in the course of your life, God draws you towards Christ. He's reeling you in. And then at the appointed time of your salvation, somebody preaches the gospel to you. For me, again, it was a preacher when I was sitting in his office and I was arguing for my own righteousness. He preached the gospel. And at that point, Holy Spirit regenerated me, made me born again. And the Father called me. And that moment I was ready. I'm like, all right, I believe. Let me get baptized right now. He's like, well, don't you want your mom to be here? I'm like, I don't care if my mom's here. This is for God. But then he talked me into waiting until Sunday. And so that way my mom could be there. But I mean, it, it, was, it was quick. It was a fast, fast turnaround. Okay? And so when we get regenerated, we want to believe. And when God calls us, we believe. But understand this. We're still choosing to believe. We're not robots. Okay, it's like this. Let's say you have a lion in here. And don't worry, Albert, he won't eat you. But let's say we have a lion in here. And you have a bowl of raw red meat and a bowl of cabbage. And you put both of those before the lion. You are giving the lion a choice. But what is it going to choose 100% of the time? It's going to go with that meat. If you just gave him the cabbage, he's going to be like, I'm going to eat you, man. You know. So the thing is, you're giving the lion a choice. But why does the lion choose the meat right now? Because by nature, that lion is a carnivore. He's been that way ever since the fall. But what does the Bible tell us is going to happen at the resurrection? The lion will be playing with little kids, and the wolf will lie down with the lamb, and all that kind of stuff. God will change the nature of that lion to where it will eat that cabbage. Okay? In both cases, the lion is choosing to eat. In one case, he's choosing to eat the meat, and after resurrection, the lion will choose to eat the cabbage. Same with you. You are choosing to reject Jesus, but once you are regenerated and God calls you, you are choosing to believe. It's what you want to do because now you have a new nature, and you want to act in accordance with that nature. Now, I want you to notice something. It is, we've mentioned there, I've mentioned there's four parts of salvation before you even believe. That's more than all the other parts, okay? God does more parts of your salvation before you believe than any other part. So that's significant. It shows that salvation is by grace alone. If God does more things of salvation before you believe (laughs) than when after you believe or during your belief, then that tells you this is all of God. Salvation is of God. So before I move on, are there any thoughts or any questions about any part of this first category of salvation, the things God does before we're saved? If you have any questions, microphone's back there. Um, I'll give like 
15 seconds for somebody to go back there. If not, I shall move it on. <laughs> Albert told me to get it done. He said, no time for questions. All right, so then I'm going to go to the next slide. This brings us to the second category, what God did the moment we believed. Okay, we believe and something happens. Okay, the first thing that happens is we are justified. And I'm only going to talk about it fast right now because I'm going to come back to it in more detail. What it means to be justified is it means to be declared righteous by God. Okay, God declares you righteous by giving you the credit of Jesus's perfect righteousness. You hear me say this every Sunday morning because I want you to know the gospel again and again, right? You don't have righteousness that will count, but God gives you Jesus's righteousness. It's perfect. It counts. It saves you, right? And at the same time, God gives you Jesus's righteousness. He forgives you of all your sins because Jesus paid them on the cross. Now, I'm going to read Romans chapter 5, or chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, because it states this perfectly. Paul says this, he says, But to the one who does not work, but believes on him, who declares the ungodly to be righteous, his faith is credited for righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the person to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, Blessed are those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered, right? That's very clear. By faith alone, it is credited to us as righteousness. We get Jesus as righteousness and we're forgiven of our sins, okay? Now, the next thing that happens, okay, so you're justified the moment you believe, meaning you're declared forgiven, you're declared righteous. The second thing that happens right when you believe is you're adopted, you are adopted by God into his household. We become part of God's family. People often wrongly say that all people are the children of God, but that's not true. All people are created by God, so in that sense we're his offspring. But because of sin, those who do not believe in Jesus, they're not God's children. In John chapter 8, Jesus tells the people who don't believe that their father's the devil, right? So there's people whose father is the devil, and there's people whose father is God. Those who believe in Jesus, God is our Father. Now, adoption comes through faith alone. So justification comes through faith alone. You believe and you're declared righteous and forgiven. You're also adopted through faith alone. If we look at uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, Paul says, For through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, so it's through faith. We get all the benefits of being the children of God. That's what it means. <clears throat> it means we inherit the world with Jesus Christ. And in the meantime, God will discipline us as sons rather than judge us. So if we do dumb things consistently, he'll discipline us, but he's not judging us because now we're sons. We're part of the family. That's what Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 8 says. Now remember, if you go back to Ephesians 1 when I quoted it, it says we are predestined for adoption as sons. But it doesn't happen in real time until we believe. In fact, John chapter 1, verse 12, John tells us this. He says, but to all who did receive him, Jesus, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name. Okay, so you have to believe. This faith has to be yours. And when you believe, yes, you are adopted and you are now part of the household of God. And once you're adopted, you're led by the Holy Spirit who teaches you to call, cry out, Abba, Father, to God. And that's what Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 15 says. Okay, so really, that was really easy, right? That the second category, there's only two things that happen the moment you believe, justification and adoption. Afterward comes the third category of what God does in our salvation. And that's what God does for the rest of our lives, what does he do for the rest of our lives? He sanctifies us. What's the will of God for your life? Sanctification. Sanctification. This is the only part that happens between, this is the only part that happens um, in, in the sense of what God does for the rest of your life. Okay, this is the only aspect of salvation. And what it means is he's setting you apart as holy to do his holy work. He makes you more and more like Jesus as you start to live more and more holy lives. Now, I'm going to talk a lot more about sanctification and justification at the end of this. I'm going to come back to both of them. These two together are going to be the most important aspects of salvation for us 
And I'm not saying that the most important part is salvation. I'm saying that the most important aspect of salvation for us as it relates to spiritual formation, the, this class, right? All the doctrines of salvation are important. But when it comes to spiritual formation, it comes down to understanding justification and sanctification. We are saved the moment we believe, and yet we're being saved our whole lives. Now you got to replace the word saved there with the proper terms. We are justified the moment we believe, and we are sanctified for the rest of our lives. Both justification and sanctification are aspects of being saved. They just refer to different parts of salvation. And it's those two facts that are going to drive everything else I'm going to teach in this course. Now, one more part, the fourth part. What part of salvation, or what, what, what does God do after we die? What, what's salvation after we die? Because we have been saved, we're being saved, and the Bible says we will be saved. Future tense. Okay, so first thing you've got to understand is after you die, your soul goes to be at home with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 says, So we are always confident and know that we, while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Okay, so if you're here, you're away from the Lord. But if you're away from the body, you're with the Lord, right? You're in his presence, beholding his glory. But listen, that's not final salvation, okay? You're not gonna just be a ghost on a cloud playing a harp forever and ever. No, we are meant to have a body. That's why the Bible emphasizes the resurrection. So according to uh, Philippians 3.21, a day is coming. He says he will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Now you read between the lines on that, our bodies are going to be like Jesus' body. When he was raised from the dead, he did amazing things. He teleported, walked through walls, he flew, um, he could eat, um, he could catch fish in an amazing way. I mean, listen, Jesus was able to do a lot. You know, because he was in that glorified body. I am looking forward to making the Avengers look like amateurs, you know, and they're all fake. But the point is our resurrection body is going to be quite amazing and we're going to live in a new heaven and a new earth, which isn't going to have all the problems of this earth and, and this universe. And so that's where it's all going. That's what it means that God will save us, okay, that we're going to be resurrected. So pretty much we are those in whom God has worked his power to change our nature, give us the new birth so that we would then come to him in faith. And since we have come to him in faith, he's now forgiven us of our sin. He's filled us with his righteousness. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in us and sanctify us so we could live more and more holy lives. And he's going to continue this until we die or we get resurrected. And at that point, we will be perfect, we will be powerful, and we will be with God forever and ever. So I do have a question before I move on if anybody wants to share now that we've covered all the aspects of salvation, what, what's your favorite part of salvation, personally, if anybody wanted to share? David? Um, for me, it would be adoption. And I, it, just only because um, justification and sanctification a lot of times are very highlighted, whether it's in um, commentaries or just uh, books, but adoption is really a huge part of um, our identity in Christ. Yeah, and it emphasizes the relationship. It emphasizes the closeness of God to us. The other ones can sound very mechanical, right? But adoption is, oh, wow, we're part of the family, you know, and he's our father. So I, I, I agree. Adoption. And by the way, Carlos, when I'm done with this class, he's been forever wanting to teach a deep dive on the doctrine of adoption. So, um, so if that's your favorite one, I don't know how many lessons he's got, but uh, this was like what he's working on, his PhD. So uh, you'll be getting some, some more on adoption when, when it's his turn to teach. Uh, but anyhow, moving on, I brought up the doctrine of salvation so that we could better understand ourselves. Okay, we are beings who are going to live forever, and we were predestined for great things for all eternity. It means when you understand salvation, all parts of it, it means there's a goal and purpose to our lives, right? And God is the one leading it, okay? You don't have to figure out your own purpose. He's already got that mapped out for you. But I want you to think about something, okay? We are not right now in the past uh, where God elected, drew, called, and regenerated us, right? We're not there anymore. That's we're not living in the past when God was doing those pre-salvation things. We're also not in the future yet where we have been resurrected and we'll live on the new earth with God. We are in the right now. What part of salvation is happening right now? 
Sanctification, there you go. That's what's happening right now. And you could say justification and sanctification. Yes, justification happened the moment you believed, but you're still justified right now, right? And so that's ongoing. And then, of course, sanctification, okay? So that's where we're at on God's timeline. So if salvation was a map, we would put the little peg and it says, you are here, right? And that's important for us to understand because if we're talking about spiritual formation, it occurs on that spot, you are here. Okay, that's, that's the, the point of this class. We have to understand um, where we are on the map of salvation so we understand exactly what things God uses to form us spiritually. So we need to understand how justification and sanctification relate to each other so we can understand how spiritual formation will happen. Because unfortunately, there is a lot of confusion on this. Justification, to give you a little more on that, is the doctrine that the moment you believe on Jesus, when you trust him and surrender your life to him, at that moment of real and true faith, something important happens. God the Father declares you righteous. Now what that means is he's giving the end time verdict. So think about it. In the end, everybody's going to stand before the great white throne and God gives the verdict. Everybody who hears the verdict then will be condemned, right? Those who believe, he gives us the verdict now. And the verdict now is righteous rather than guilty. Righteous. So he's declaring your end time verdict right now. You are righteous and you are forgiven. Now, how can God do this? You've heard me preach it a million times. Jesus lived a perfectly righteous life. He did everything right all the time. We did everything wrong. Okay, there's a swapping of accounts. So Jesus goes to that cross. All of our sin gets put in his account. He pays for it all. And then all of his righteousness gets put in our account. So we're forgiven because he pays our debt. We're declared righteous because his righteousness is given to us, right? So all of your sin was put in his account 2,000 years ago. But that doesn't get credited to you until you believe right now, okay? When you believe right now, then it all gets credited to you. That's why the moment you come to Christ in faith... You are saved that exact second because at that exact second, your sins are wiped away by the cross and your account is filled with the credit of all of Jesus's righteousness. And it's by grace alone through faith alone. OK, you, you can't earn it. You can never earn it because no matter how much good you do, one, you can't make your sins go away. And what's your good like? Your good is like a polluted garment. OK, so only God could solve this problem. By having Jesus pay our debt for us on the cross. Very simple. Now, the reason why we have to understand this is it protects you from self-righteousness where you think that you can be good enough to where God owes you salvation. No, impossible. Blasphemy. Okay? That, that, that whole idea is an insult to God's perfect holiness. But what does John 3.16 say? God so loved the world that he made a way for us to be saved. And it's a free gift you can never earn. That's why it's called grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Now, I, I bring that up because this doctrine is so beautiful that sometimes people try to read justification into every single instance where the Bible mentions righteousness. And I've been hitting this in my Matthew series, um, but the point is you can't do that. Sometimes the Bible uses the word righteousness in a specific way that means justification to be declared righteous by God. Most of the time, the Bible uses the word righteousness in a general way. Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, uses it in a general way. It comes from the Hebrew word sadaka, which I have up in there for those who like to read Hebrew, but sadaka, and it means a lot of things. In general, it means to live in a way that pleases God. Live in a way that pleases God. If God says, tell the truth, and you tell the truth, that's righteous. If God says, take care of the poor, and you take care of the poor, that's righteous. If God tells you to look after the widow and the orphan, that's righteous. If God tells you to share the gospel with the lost, that's righteous. If you do those things, you are doing sadaka. You're doing righteousness. So the question is, can you be righteous by what you do? Yes, by the general definition, you can. By the general definition of what righteousness means, you can. A lot of guys in the Old Testament are said to be righteous, and it's not in a context where it's talking about them receiving uh, righteousness from God. 
You have these imperfect people like Noah, but they're being said in Job that they're, they're, we're being told they're righteous. Now, they're righteous because their lives were for the most part lived in obedience to God. But here's the question we have to ask. Does that contradict what Paul says about justification? No. When we are talking about final salvation before God's courtroom, his declaration of righteous or wicked, if you're going to be declared righteous, it requires absolute perfection. Okay, And that final courtroom decision, it's not that, oh, I just generally live a righteous life. No, either you're perfect or you're not. And if you're not perfect, you're damned because you're wicked. Okay, Unless the one who is perfect, Jesus, he gives you the credit of his righteousness, and boom. That is what is necessary for salvation. That's why we need his righteousness credited to us. Okay, but when we're talking about the general sense of righteousness, we're just talking about the way someone lives. If they usually obey God, you could say that's a righteous person. Why? Because they're living righteously. They're consistently doing the things that please God, and they regularly avoid the things that God pro prohibits. Think of how the book of Kings, or in the book of Samuel, repeatedly talks about the life of David. We know David did some bad things, okay, but it repeatedly tells us that David was the standard. He was righteous, and he's the one that all the other kings were compared to because the general posture of his life was righteous. But in terms of justification, no, that's by faith alone. That only comes through the uh, imputation of Christ's righteousness. Now, this should not be hard for us to hold both of these ideas of righteousness together. Why? Because it goes back to these two words. One is justification, the other is sanctification. As long as you understand that, that both of these are righteousness, they're just different kinds of righteousness, then, then you'll get it. See, justification is what I already explained. It's when God declares you righteous for believing in Jesus. I'm going to give you a technical term. It's imputed righteousness. Imputed. You, you need to know this word, right? Imputed righteousness. What that means is, let's say, it's a transferring of accounts, right? It's a banking term, actually. So let's say it's to take credit from one account and transfer it to another. If I transferred $100 from my checking account into your checking account, I'm not going to do it, but if I did, then the technical term is I imputed $100 to you. It's now yours. You didn't earn it. It wasn't even really your $100, but now it's credited to you, right? It's, it's in your account. That's what justification is. Jesus' righteousness is now filling up our account. Our account is full before God, right? That's justification. But it doesn't change your nature. God putting Jesus' righteousness in your account doesn't make you start living righteous. It just means in God's view, you are reckoned righteous. Your account is filled with Jesus' righteousness. But in order for you to start living righteously, there's something else that needs to happen, and that is sanctification. Sanctification is not imputed righteousness. Here's a different I word. It's imparted righteousness. So justification's imputed. Sanctification's imparted. You understand the difference between those? One is just something's put in your account, but impartation is different. It now starts making you live righteously. Sanctification, remember, it means to be set apart by God is holy. It's the process where the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, makes you more and more like Jesus. So justification declares you to be righteous with Jesus' own righteousness, but then sanctification starts to change you so that you live in a way that starts to increasingly match what God has declared about you in your justification. Does that make sense? You get justified first, and then you get sanctified for the rest of your life. Roman Catholics get this wrong. They say you get sanctified first and then justified. That's why they believe in works-based salvation. They got it wrong. When you flip it, then it's like, no, we're saved by faith alone, but the one who's saved is going to do works for their whole life. You're declared righteous by Jesus' righteousness, but you're also righteous because of the way you live. It, if you have it in the right order, it works. Justification, then sanctification. It's only when you flip them and you confuse them, that's where you get all sorts of craziness going on. So, even though justification is done by God alone, the Bible describes, and this is where we have to understand this, the Bible describes sanctification as you and God working together. Everything else in your salvation, God does by himself. You don't do anything. 
All you do is sin, (laughs) and God overcomes that. But once he saves you, and once he gives you your new nature through regeneration, and now he's declared you righteous, and he's sanctifying you, now there's something you start doing too, because you can do something now. And so what God does is he gives you the Bible, which teaches you how to think and live. He gives you the Holy Spirit that writes the Bible on your heart so that you want to obey it. He gives you your local church so that as a group, we can all help each other along as we live righteously. For example, if this course helps you live more like Jesus and know him better, this is part of your sanctification. You showing up and listening and taking notes and thinking about this, that's you working with God. God providing me to teach you this is you working with God, right? It's you and God working together on this, okay? And and of course, he uses the local church for that. So that's what God puts into it. But you put something into it too. You got to read the Bible. You got to study it. You have to go out of your way to obey it. You got to go make disciples of people. You have to flee from sin and, and help the poor. That's all stuff that we do. It's part of our sanctification. And when we do those things, they are righteous. They are righteous things. It's imparted righteousness where the Holy Spirit, the Bible, and your own will are working together to do the righteous things that please God. It's very important for us to understand this because it has everything to do with us living holy and righteous lives. Now, it's not self-righteous because we know ultimately we're saved by Christ's righteousness. But we also know that God's pleased with us when we obey him and we live righteously. And so if, if you're, let's say you wanted to be a pastor, you definitely have to model this for your people. But for all Christians, all Christians, we have to understand that we are saved by Christ's righteousness, but God's pleased when we live for him. So we should live for him. Spiritual formation is a very important part of your sanctification. It's the, and that's the part of the salvation we're in. So this whole, remember how last week I started off, what's the will of God for your life, your sanctification? I'm now explaining why that's the will of God for your life. Because that's the part right now where God is asking you to contribute something, and it's between now and when you're called to glory, okay? And so spiritual formation is not something you graduate from. You never get your diploma until you die, okay? This is something we're always growing at. We're always um, applying these and getting better and better at it. And so your salvation is who you are, and your sanctification is what is going to help you become a better man or woman of God. So with that, that is this lesson. Remember how last week I said, uh, I mentioned that it's not all doctrine. We hear and we do, right? So, so the, the discipleship really comes down to, you know, you having doctrinal mastery, like you know the word of God, but then you have to combine it with character, moral character, and skillful living. This lesson aimed specifically at doctrine. Future lessons are going to focus on your character and what we do. So I know this one might have seemed like it went against the grain of what I was saying, but no, doctrine lays the foundation. That's why I gave you the doctrine today. And then in the upcoming weeks, we're going to be doing stuff with it. Even so, I got some personal application for you. And so here's how it's going to work. I want you to get with a partner or maybe a couple partners. And don't go too crazy with this. Just be quick with it. Here's what I want you to do. Take turns summarizing for each other the various doctrines of salvation that we discussed. So we have four that are before God, before we believe. That's election, drawing, regeneration, and calling. So take turns explaining these to each other in layman's terms, just to make sure you understand them. Then you got the, the two doctrines of salvation the moment you believe, justification and adoption. Then you got the one that is after you believe but before you die, sanctification. And then you got um, the two after you die. That's dying and being a ghost in heaven. And then after that, resurrection, right? So, so the, the, which is called glorification, right? So summarize those to each other. And then the second part is describe justification and the importance of it to your partner. And then the other partner describes sanctification and the importance of it. And just do your best. This is so that you don't forget it the second you hear it. If I force you to talk about it and use it a little bit, you're going to cling on to it a little more. 
Okay, I'm not going to be walking around snooping on you to like, nope, nope, that's heresy. Just do your, just do your best. I'm going to give you five minutes, and then we have another, uh, another group assignment at the end. And so we'll, we'll try to go through these quick. So go ahead and have fun with this. And then, I know that says 13 minutes. I don't know why. We're not Good morning, everyone. Einsteinian Welcome time to dilation Sovereign at Christian five Church. minutes. Calling it. Our service will begin in just five minutes. Joining us today, our service will begin in two minutes. Please begin making your way to the auditorium.
think you guys are the first to finish. out that stony heart. All righty. So I, I hope you guys had an, a, enough time to go through that. Hopefully uh, you, you're able to sharpen yourselves with this. So um, the last thing, and the way this is explained, no, we're not going to do it this way. It says uh, create a short presentation. No, no, we're, we're not going to create any presentation. We're just going to talk really quickly about this because it's already 812. And, and so he, here's what it is, right? I want you to discuss the relationship between faith and works in the life of a believer. And this is where, you know, you could go to the, the microphone. We'll just talk about this together for a couple minutes. Um, because this is one of the big confusing things, right? We know we're not saved by works, but some people act like, well, then that means you don't do any works at all. You know, you, you know, believing in Jesus is fire insurance and you can live however you want, but we know that's not true. And so how do we put faith and works together together? without believing in works-based salvation. Hopefully, you've been given the, the components in this lesson to answer that. So, Keith, you look like, uh, like you're ready to go. Well, faith would be our belief in Jesus Christ. Okay, yep. And works would be evidence of that faith. Okay, so work, So faith is the belief, and then works is the just works. the natural fruit that comes from that belief. Correct. Yeah, I like it. Awesome, and it's like that verse in, uh, in in James, I believe it's chapter two, where it says somebody says that he has faith, but he doesn't have works, will that faith save him? And it goes on, and there's obviously discussions about that verse. But those works are evidence that your that your faith was true, that the Lord has saved you. You will produce works if you are truly born again by the Lord. It will be manifested in your life as you continue to to be drawn towards Him. Your sanctification is ongoing, and as you're set apart as holy. Amen. In fact, James in that passage says, "Fool." I will show you my faith by my works. So it's exactly right. Charles, Charles in charge. So uh, a believer coming to a saving faith, I look at works as it's like the, ordin the adorning of a living and true faith, you know. It's that garland of grace that God places on us, you know. And it's a way in which we express a true thankful heart to God for saving us and, and the sharing that of that thankfulness to others. So it's kind of an adorning I look at it, you know. Okay, so like a gratitude that pretties up the tree yeah. in a bit. Because yeah, if you think about it, like, I'd say faith mm -hmm. is kind of, it, it, it's the tree, it's the root of everything mm -hmm. else, and then all the leaves and the fruit, those are the things you're doing, mm -hmm. right? But if, if there's no fruit and no leaves, then yeah. you would assume there's no root, which right. means there's no faith. A true faith will always lead to that. Yeah, and, and fruit is the part of the, uh, you know, the ornamentation of, of a true living faith. Amen. Lelo. Yes. Uh, well, um, we've been having with this conversation with my sister in Mexico, and, and she's Catholic, and uh, they believe that we have to do works. And I say, okay, we have to do that because we're Christians. In Ephesians 2.10, that's what it says. The works work. God gave us the works to do because we're Christians. It's like an orange tree, even oranges, because it's an orange tree, mm. not to be an orange tree. Yeah, it's not like oranges make the tree. The tree makes the oranges, right? And so, so very good. Uh, any others? Okay, David. 
Um, I was just going to touch on the part where you kind of mentioned the the relationship between the two in terms of maybe um, staying humble through it so that you don't sometimes get tripped up like we can and think that we're justified by doing more um, or get so stuck on works where it's the humility of understanding that it's a grace that you've been saved. And like my brothers had touched upon, the love and adoration of God is why we produce and why we um, do works. Excellent. So here's what I'm going to add to this. I'm going to use the, the phraseology, or if we want to sound really smart, I'm going to use the nomenclature of this lesson. Faith is what brings you justification, right? Faith alone is what saves you justification. And then sanctification is faith being perfected by works throughout the course of your life. So that's where you put it in. Like when people are like, no, you have to do the works. You'd be like, well, well, what are you talking about? Are you talking about justification? If they're like, yes, you're like, then you are a heretic. And you could say it as bold as you want. Because we're not justified by works. We're declared righteous by faith alone because we get the imputation of Jesus' righteousness. You can't add anything to his perfection. It's already full, right? So, so justification is by faith. But if somebody's like, no, you have to do works. And you're like, well, what do you mean? Justification? If they're like, no, no, I mean like sanctification. And even if they don't know that word, if, if they're like, well, no, I, I'm saved because I believe, but then because of that, it should be leading to me, you know, living for Christ. Amen. You got it right. So, so faith deals specifically with justification. Sanctification is still faith, but it's now faith being perfected by those works. And so those works, those things that you do, that's you in cooperation with God that helps you grow into greater maturity and a more effective disciple for the Lord. So when we're doing a class on spiritual formation. We're focusing specifically on faith being perfected by works, by us doing the right things, learning the right things, um, you know, following the spiritual disciplines like prayer, fasting, Bible reading, Bible meditation, all that stuff I'm going to teach in the course of this because these are all the things that make our faith stronger and make our faith more effective as we're engaging with the world. So if you walk out of here knowing that, then I've done my job. If I've confused you, I apologize. It was not my intent, but hopefully this all made sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close us in prayer, and then we could uh, kill the, um, the stream, and we'll be good to go. Lord God, we just uh, thank you that we're able to gather together and, and talk about the doctrine of salvation. And really, you know, we were able to hit all the main pieces in, in a single lesson, um, which you know, there's a lot more that could be said, but Lord, I think this suffices. This is, uh, this is enough for people to, to grow and understand specifically where the spiritual formation is going to happen, where we are on that map. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll bless everyone who is attending and listening online and, you know, doing the hard work of taking notes and trying to remember this so that they could grow and become more like you, Jesus. And I pray in the upcoming weeks that uh, you will continue to just grow, um, everybody who's willing to, to do the things that your word calls us to do um, for our sanctification. And so, Lord, we uh, just pray all this to you and pray that you get all the glory because you deserve all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you guys for coming out on another Wednesday night.